Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk about my work on uh, exchange network dynamics today. And uh, it will be about pretty much like trying to understand uh, uh, some complex system where the data is not enough to tell a story. So you have to fill in the gaps with your knowledge. First, I want to give you a little bit of context and introductions. IMC is a trading company in Amsterdam, uh, like based in Amsterdam, with offices in uh, Chicago and Sydney as well. And uh, I work as a performance analyst in there. And uh, here, performance means the performance of uh, networks and systems. So we heavily uh, value uh, automation. And uh, like most of our trading is not done by people, but uh, by actual, uh, like by, uh, by auto traders, which are uh, hosted on servers. And uh, for that, like the performance is an integral uh, part of it. And uh, yeah, finally, we are. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you might have seen our booth already, and we are hiring. So if you are interested in uh, like living in one of these uh, three cities, feel free to check out uh, the carriers section. First, uh, I want to give you how this uh, automated trading works in a uh, very high level. Uh, the, the way we start with is first, uh, you have a signal that you may want to react on. So this signal can be uh, like any piece of knowledge. It could be uh, market data. It could be uh, like some news update. It could be Donald Trump tweet. But in here, everything uh, we just treat it as a signal and assume that our system can parse it and uh, make use of it. So then we have this participant, which is, uh, happens to be a machine. And then uh, based on the signal, they make decisions to uh, whether to send an uh, order or not. And then the order will go through a network. It will eventually reach the exchange. So signal, uh, signal, then send order, network, exchange, profit. And uh, the thing is, uh, most of like, uh, mo like, when you get a signal, it actually comes with uh, some uh, reaction window uh, attached to it. So uh, suppose you get this uh, tweet, uh, and it has some window of uh, like half a millisecond. Of course, you are not aware of it. But then you send an order, uh, and uh, the network appears to be busy, and it, uh, it takes you a second to uh, actually reach there, which is actually ridiculous. But uh, then you will be too late, and your orders uh, won't be successful anymore. So, like, and we want to uh, avoid that uh, to be able to do our business. So then the question to ask is, like, the first thing that comes to mind is, uh, if I uh, improved my reaction time uh, a little bit, uh, would it actually affect my chances? Would I uh, be able to do better? And the other question that you might want to ask is, uh, how is this opportunity window uh, even? Like, uh, how much does this matter? Uh, if it was the uh, other way around, if I was late all the time, uh, how much uh, of my orders uh, would end up being successful? So like, that's the type of uh, questions uh, that we want to answer. It's not an exhaustive list, but that's like, the type of analysis we do when we are looking into how this network, uh, how this network works. So to do this, uh, we want to, of course, look at the data and then uh, come up with insights. But here, the trouble is uh, most of the time, the data you get will not be uh, enough uh, to answer these questions. Either, uh, like the, like either uh, like, uh, the, the actually the variables you are looking for won't even be in the data, or, uh, or uh, even if they are in the data, uh, sometimes you can fit a, a model to it, but it, it won't have much uh, of a power to explain anything. In those cases, we want to like, uh, still uh, make use of the data, but uh, add what we know about the system uh, into, into the model. So most of the time, for instance, uh, we won't know the path an individual uh, order we sent to the network took, but we will have some knowledge about uh, uh, how this network is uh, connected, like what components are there, what are the, uh, who are the vendors, how do they behave, how does the queuing in this network uh, how does this queuing network, queuing effects, uh, affect our orders? So to do this, uh, like uh, we need uh, approaches that actually allow encoding our knowledge into uh, the model as well. And 
here uh, I'm going to talk about uh, two approaches that, uh, that helps you do that. And where, uh, with these approaches, I think uh, encoding your uh, knowledge uh, comes uh, naturally. So the first one is uh, PyMC3, the probabilistic uh, programming language, uh, where you encode your knowledge as uh, distributions and parameters. And the other one is uh, through discrete event simulations, where uh, if, if, you don't have a, if you cannot represent your knowledge just with probability distributions, if you cannot work out the math or if it's just impossible, then uh, you can simply just uh, code out uh, the behavior and then uh, simulate it. Uh, what is not in here is uh, like the uh, supervised learning, because as I said, like uh, if the data does not have enough, uh, like does, is not sufficient, then just getting the data and throwing it into your uh, favorite machine learning algorithm might not work. But uh, in the probabilistic part, uh, there are some like, uh, in the submodels, there's some under the hood uh, parts of supervised learning as well in form of uh, linear models. First, uh, here I'm going to actually talk about uh, PyMC with a more uh, high level uh, model and then uh, move on to discrete event simulations. And uh, yeah, PyMC part will be a bit uh, shorter compared to discrete event parts. And with the discrete event part, I'm going to uh, show a couple uh, code examples as well. But first, yeah, with PyMC, uh, just like for those that don't know, it's a probabilistic programming language. Uh, you represent your, uh, your model in terms of uh, variables. And these variables can be uh, free random variables, which are uh, variables that you sample from a distribution. Or they can be observed, which means it's your data. Or it can be deterministic, which means it's a, a function of uh, these variable, uh, other variables uh, in your model. And uh, uh, below, like the, at the right part is, uh, yeah, some uh, example of a model, which is not very visible, but it's like just one of the uh, many models that uh, I played around with uh, when, I, uh, when I used PyMC to solve this issue. So it's uh, like pretty much you in the end have a graph where you can see that uh, which variables end up generating which variables and uh, how do they uh, end up with, uh, at the data. So with the high level model, it works as follows. We, at this point, we add a little bit of uh, our knowledge uh, about the network. We know that the network is uh, prone to queuing. So the, like we, are, we end up queuing behind other packets in some cases. And this, uh, these cases we call bursts. So uh, there are moments that, uh, that are busy in the network. And if we get caught in a burst, we end up queuing. So then the first thing we uh, want to model is uh, how often do these bursts happen and uh, how often do we end up queuing when there's a burst. And then the second thing is, the thing that we can control is uh, our own uh, performance, which is our reaction time. So then we have an abstract variable that uh, uh, generates, uh, our, uh, generates the parameters of our reaction time uh, distribution. So I'm not going to uh, like go all the way and uh, all the details of the model in here. But the thing is, in the end, uh, these uh, like high-level parameters will uh, generate uh, the actual model parameters, which in the end will uh, generate the uh, observed variables, which are our success rate, uh, our reaction time, and how long did it take to uh, reach the uh, matching engine. And these are actually kind of related. Like the fastest we are, the more successful we are uh, going to be, and the less likely we are going to queue. And since we are going to queue less, we, uh, we are going to take less time to matching engine. And this time to matching engine is a mixture distribution because uh, when you queue versus when you don't queue, you have uh, two different uh, latency characteristics. And here, uh, uh, to fit uh, to data, I use uh, variational inference, which worked out fine. And uh, then we get some posterior samples. So then the first thing to do is to do some sanity check to make sure that uh, the model is not completely off the track. So like you're not trying to match uh, uh, the, the distribution and the data, they are not trying to match 100%, uh, but if the distribution is completely off, then you have to, of course, go back and uh, revise your model. So it's not a perfect match, but it also doesn't sound like we look like uh, we have done uh, something horribly wrong. 
and it can also estimate the success rate relatively closely. So then, uh, based uh, after this, we can look into this, uh, all the other parameters of the model that answer some of our questions. Like, uh, first it uh, tells us, again, the distribution of our reaction time, but it also tells how often we are queuing, like how, and how, how much bursts are there, what is our success rate, and finally, uh, if we were extremely late, uh, uh, late to react, then uh, how bad would our success rate be? Like, what's the absolute uh, worst, worst case scenario? Yeah, so this is where I'm going to uh, stop with PyMC. There are actually like uh, more things that uh, I could have uh, talked about. For instance, uh, we could have wanted to add more detail uh, to the model. Uh, instead of just uh, this uh, queuing effects success failure, we could try to uh, look into each and every component uh, that uh, causes these latencies and then create, uh, create an additive model of these latencies. And the second thing we could have tried to do is this reaction win window that I mentioned, that where you are too late, you no longer uh, are successful. We could have uh, tried to model this uh, more explicitly. And finally, one other uh, thing that uh, would be uh, nice to look at is the comparison of uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo versus variational inference and see how much the, uh, our estimations uh, change. Yeah. Now I'm uh, moving on to discrete event simulations. So uh, the idea of a discrete event simulation is uh, that, and why it's called discrete event is, uh, this is a simulation where uh, you have events that have been scheduled to happen, and what it does is the simulator does not simulate each and every single time unit, but it just fast forwards to the next event in there. And then you have processes that listen for the events and then generate events. So in case of SimPy, uh, the way uh, it works out is uh, you first have an environment object, which pretty much is actually your uh, simulation and keeps track of time. And then uh, you have events which are uh, single instances uh, and they are either uh, not scheduled yet, scheduled to happen, or they fired or they might have failed. And then you have processes which uh, listen for these events and generate these events and they can be either uh, uh, represent uh, physical uh, objects like the uh, network switches or the participant in the network uh, but it, they could also uh, represent uh, like actions, uh, actions that are one-off. So the difference is the processes are um, uh, like uh, processes are uh, generators uh, in SimPy, and so if you have a like a while through loop that never ends, then uh, it will be one of these uh, physical processes that are unending. Whereas if you have a generator uh, that is finite, then you will have a one-off process uh, that tends to represent an action. Finally, there are uh, resources, and what the resources uh, do, like they are, uh, they, they are convenience uh, features that help you not come up with your own data structures, and then you can model queuing effects, congestions, uh, waiting for uh, like the semaphores and such, uh, such without like explicitly coding them. And the way SimPy works is uh, you use the same interface for uh, waiting for an event to happen or waiting for a process to finish or waiting for a resource to be released. So that's actually quite convenient uh, when you are coding this out. So now uh, I'm going to uh, show the network with a bit more detail. So just opening up. And uh, we have uh, we have uh, two switches uh, on first layer, one switch between us and the matching engine, uh, and uh, we have multiple uh, participants. So uh, first thing that we can add to this discrete event simulation is the structure of this network. Second thing is uh, we know that the ob our observed variables, they are latencies, so uh, they are delays, so we can actually uh, add this to our model as well. So with, in networking, there are uh, four types of delay. You have uh, propagation, which is essentially the time it takes for a signal to reach uh, from one physical place to another. So it's determined by uh, cable lengths and uh, speed of light. 
and then you have the processing time, which is like the switch actually reads the packet and then decides on what to do with it. And uh, you have transmission, uh, which is the, the, the switch uh, writing uh, a packet uh, to the line, which is determined by the size of the packet and the line rate, like how many gigabits per uh, second. And finally, we have queuing delay. If multiple packets are going uh, for the same line, then one has to wait for the transmission time of the other. Next, uh, we know that there are bur bursts in the network, and we know that uh, these can be multiple packets, so this is something we can take into account as well. We can simulate these bursts as uh, some participant groups that uh, uh, send out a handful of packets. And finally, we have uh, queuing. The, the queuing we uh, see in the network, normally uh, you expect the queues to be FIFO, first in, first out. The thing is this, uh, FIFO, uh, this uh, FIFO property only works out uh, to a certain time precision. If the packets are really close to each other, and by close to each other, I mean like in terms of like, uh, like uh, tens of nanoseconds, then you can uh, have reordering at the, uh, at the queue as well. So then you have to add this non-deterministic uh, effect into the uh, simulation to make it more accurate. Yeah, so first some uh, building blocks to show you how it works. You create an environment object uh, as the simulation. And then here are some, uh, like these are custom uh, classes that contain uh, processes in them. Here, this is a very simple network with two participants, Alice and Bob, a single switch and a matching engine. And then uh, we use the uh, run uh, method of the environment to uh, run it for a duration. It's mostly like all the debugging and stuff that are not really, uh, relevant to the uh, slide. Uh, for, uh, then uh, here's an example uh, of uh, an object, and here uh, we like this is a, a perfect uh, FIFO switch with uh, three different processes. So the first uh, we have method that uh, takes incoming uh, packets from a queue called incoming packets, and that means like that process will be blocked until some packet actually come to the queue. And after that, it will uh, process these packets, wait for the processing delay. And here, this process packet function, it will, it's a, a like one-time generator. So it, every, time, uh, every time a packet gets processed, we will create a new process uh, just for this uh, action. And after this processing is complete, they will go to the output queue. And then uh, in the queue, you see in the, uh, in the loop, like the, the transmission will happen with one packet at a time, and then uh, if uh, there are multiple packets, then the other packet will have to wait for the transmission delay of the, uh, of the first one. Then we run the simulation, and we get an, uh, we can, if we are debugging it, we can get some uh, output. And uh, we can see that uh, first, yeah, in here everything is deterministic, nothing random uh, so far. So they, uh, there are periodical signals, they receive the signal at the same time, they react at the same time, and uh, then they eventually go to the uh, switch, and then we can see that one has to wait uh, for the uh, transmission delay of the other, and then eventually they reach the matching engine. So, so far, yeah, what I uh, showed you was, uh, yeah, super deterministic and uh, simpler example. We have to add this uh, first the non-determinism that I mentioned to the switches to make the simulation work. Then we have to add a signal uh, generator object that uh, represents signals uh, being random and not just periodic signals. And finally, uh, we need to add a burst object that, uh, uh, that represents uh, multiple packets that happen to be at the same time uh, in the same switch as us. So, I'm not going to the details of these, so I'm going to uh, fast forward to then how it would look like when uh, we put all of this together. We first have, uh, then we first have a, uh, the exchange, which is the, like the structure I showed you before. Uh, then 
we know that it's the tree where uh, the matching engine is the root of the tree, and uh, the participants are the uh, leaves of the uh, leaves of it. So we just create objects accordingly and tell them uh, the destinations. Next, uh, we actually uh, put all the uh, randomness in the simulation uh, in there. So we have a first we have distributions that. Uh, that we know, at least we think we know, like the distribution of the uh, signal and uh, the processing delay of the switch. But there are also distributions that are parameterized, like the ones that we sort of have a vague idea about how they work, but uh, we don't know the uh, exact parameters. That's what we are going to search for. So that's, uh, that's the uh, number of uh, reactions on average we might, ex uh, ex sorry, number of uh, like burst packets uh, we might expect uh, on a switch, and uh, the distribution of uh, our window, and uh, and uh, the time offset of the reactions compared uh, of the bursts compared to our uh, reaction, and finally we have our reaction time distribution. It is known, it is, uh, but we still parameterize it because after uh, we work out the simulation, we also want to. Uh, speculate about if we change our reaction time, how would things go differently? So these are the parameters that I mentioned, and uh, the average reaction time is a parameter that is parameterized, but we fix it when we are fitting the model. And we have a uh, like to optimize. We use energy distance between the distribution uh, distribution generated by uh, the a simulation versus the uh, actual distribution of the data. So again, uh, a pretty uh, close uh, distribution. Of course, it doesn't capture details very well, but it's not extremely uh, far off. And uh, after fitting the model, then we can actually then modify our reaction time and see that if we, react, uh, if we were 50 nanoseconds faster, uh, how much uh, success rate would it correspond to? So then uh, you run the simulation again, but with different reaction time parameters, and it will be a bit noisy uh, depending on uh, how long you run the uh, simulation. In here, these are like actually only five minute chunks, but in this high frequency world, uh, like even a second is an eternity, so it's usually uh, enough to uh, see what's going on. So then this tells us that, yeah, if we were uh, uh, 50 nanoseconds faster, then our success rate would approach 88% and whatnot. Yeah, so then uh, we have uh, two ways of uh, dealing with this problem, where we incorporate our knowledge into the model. First, we have PyMC and then uh, SymPy uh, for uh, discrete events. And then the question is, like, which one to use uh, when? Uh, so in, in, uh, in my experience with our models uh, and the problems we deal with, uh, with uh, I, would, I usually start with PyMC. And unless I, when I get to the point where uh, I cannot just uh, uh, use use just distributions to model this problem anymore, I switch to SymPy. But in general, uh, if you have many parameters and uh, you want to just uh, create your model with fewer lines of code as possible, then PyMC3 is the better choice. Uh, in, case of, in case you want to add uh, more details to the as low level as possible, and if uh, your physical process has a lot of discrete variables, it means you know, choices, if then, else statements and such, uh, then, and it has many moving parts, then SymPy is better. So like you can have a huge complexity, but, if uh, but the complexity will be uh, about subparts that you know uh, how they work. And uh, finally, with uh, SymPy, uh, you can, uh, you can uh, scale it a little bit uh, better, because you, if you can relax your simulation a bit, if you uh, run, for instance, uh, only five minute chunks and such, then you can use your, you, like use PySpark, Dusk, whatever, f your favorite cluster, and then uh, just use as many processes uh, as you want. 
yeah. To summarize, I showed you ways of uh, incorporating knowledge uh, into your model, and I showed you uh, two ways of uh, doing this. And uh, my suggestion is, yeah, uh, use the shortest uh, way that's possible, and then uh, go with the more explicit and detailed way if things no longer work for you. Yeah, it's going. To, it's, it has been a bit shorter, but yeah, uh, thank you and questions. Indeed, yeah. And so do you think there's, a, and this is based on kind of information you're getting maybe from, from the world at large, right? So do you think it's possible that those bursts are correlated with when you most want to match? Like, is every mismatch equally bad, or are there some where you really like to get them? And might they be correlated with your bursts if everybody's sending sort of match requests at the same time? Uh, yes, they can indeed be correlated. It's not 100%, so there are cases where uh, Everyone wants to do the same thing at the same time, but there are uh, also uh, bursts where, um, like, uh, like because like whatever happened previously, uh, like took so long that there's like uh, they are still being processed by the network. So like they are actually unrelated events, but it's just like the previous event took too much to process, and the network still has uh, has the load of uh, this. So there are both cases. In the cases where, I mean, I guess I'm imagining a case where some piece of information drops and it means everybody like, wants to sell at the same time. Yeah, that, these definitely happen, yes. And, but those would be really bad ones to miss, right? Like, so is there a correlation? Oh, between, oh, between the, how bad is it, yeah. How bad, like the cost and the, the occurrence of that? Yeah, so uh, we looked at this and uh, there is uh, indeed, uh, like the way we look at it is, yeah, we... Um, we assign a cost to these trades, as you said, and then we look at the uh, success rate. And there is indeed, yeah, usually the higher the cost, uh, then the higher the cost, the fewer the success rate is. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So the question is about uh, like calibrating uh, the data with the discrete event simulation, right? Yeah. So uh, that's actually uh, like the way I did with this was just pretty much compare uh, distribution generated by discrete event simulation versus the actual distribution. But what I didn't really talk about how to optimize this. Ideally, I would be using some uh, either uh, similar optimization techniques in the uh, these Bayesian. Uh, methods, but in this case, it was just a like random search and grid search uh, that uh, took care of that. Any other questions? Uh, well, I have a personal question. I'm not sure if uh, the extent you're able to answer. I was curious what IMC did with this information as a result of it. So obviously, improving oh, yeah. trade execution is great, but obviously, oh yeah. Some. Yeah, actually, that's something I should have mentioned uh, earlier, so I'm glad you asked. Um, so the idea is, uh, if I get in here, like, so you have a graph like that, uh, like, that tells you that, uh, so your success rate improves, which means usually your profitability improves. But the thing is, you think faster also as a cost. This is either cost as in 
you actually pay uh, some money or it means cost in manpower uh, development time or uh, opportunity cost on not doing working on some other project so then the thing the more like the business problem that you try to answer is uh, is it worth spending my time on uh, getting uh, 50 nanoseconds 100 nanoseconds faster or should I do be uh, doing something else uh, with my time does this answer your question any hints on <laughs> uh, unfortunately not <laughs> Sorry, any other questions? Or? Okay, let's thank our speaker again and thanks very much. Thank you.